This um, event at Cana was the first of Jesus' public miracles. The first one in John's Gospel. John uh, recorded only seven miracles in his entire Gospel. And they were all intended to show the power of Jesus, who Jesus was. They were intended to strengthen the faith of the ones who had already started to believe and to bring faith to those who up to that point did not have any. So it didn't matter whether we were reading the, about the feeding of the 500 or the bringing sight to the man who had been blind from birth or the raising of Lazarus. They all were intended to bring about faith. And I think this story today can help us too when in our lives we've run out of wine or maybe run out of hope or maybe run out of luck. So I want to begin by focusing on the one who sets Jesus' career in motion. This person of great humility, but also great power. Of course, his mother Mary. Now she must have been related to the bride and groom for her to be able to take control of the events there as she did. And she knows very well that if they did run out of wine at this event, it would be a matter of great shame to the bride and groom, and she wants to prevent that. I think we could probably relate to having something like that happen in one of our big celebrations too. And so she goes to Jesus and just states very baldly, they're out of wine. Now for a moment, imagine Jesus at this celebration. This uh, wedding feast is probably been going on for a while. In, in, in that culture, weddings might last for a week. And he's, he's there with his friends, with his disciples, and he's celebrating too. And now his mother appears with this surprising announcement. I'm sure Jesus had no idea what was going on with the wine, but I'm sure he was drinking some. And so he makes this kind of off-putting remark to Mary. Why are you bothering me? It's not my, it's not my problem. <coughs> At that point, Jesus was 30 years old. He knew, probably from the time he was old enough to understand speech, that God had some special plan for him. But I'm sure, and I'm sure he had prayed often, probably on a daily basis, for his father to show him what that plan would be, when it would start, what was supposed to happen. Mary, for her part, when Jesus makes his response to her, she stays calm. She's not offended. She doesn't argue with him. Oh, come on, you've got to do something about the wine. She knows Jesus better than anyone. She'd watched him grow and mature. I'm sure she'd seen evidence of his power, of his great intelligence, and of his loving kindness. She'd known since that time of the Annunciation that God was giving to Jesus the throne of his ancestor David, that Jesus was the Son of the Most High, that he would rule the house of Jacob forever, that he would have a kingdom without end. And so Mary must have wondered and prayed about that mysterious announcement since the day that it happened. She too would be wondering, how is it all going to come about? She'd observed him when he was 12 years old, 
very much at home in the temple, questioning the priests and the elders, making good, smart responses to their questions. And she knew that he was intelligent and perceptive way beyond his years. But in all her humility, I'm sure she never suspected that she would be the catalyst that would start Jesus' mission. Jesus, after he had made his uh, remark about it not being his time yet, must have very quickly seen God's hand in all of this. And he must have been very surprised that his prayer had been answered in this particular way. And it isn't true for us, too, that we pray for things. We don't know what's going to happen. And then aren't we often surprised at how it turns out? He never suspected it would be his mother who would call him to begin his public work. And so he responds. Good lesson for us when we're, when we're praying. Be prepared for surprises. The church has always relied on Mary to intercede for us to Jesus. He listens to her. And so as sons and daughters of the church, we always have the opportunity to ask Mary to intercede for us. She certainly understands pain and anguish, the sufferings that we go through. Didn't she experience a ton of it on her own? And so I think we'd be foolish not to involve Mary in our deepest needs and prayers. For a moment, let's look at John. John was the disciple that Jesus loved. He was there at the wedding as a young man. And remember years later, when Jesus, Jesus was dying on the cross, he gave his mother to John. Son, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. So that Mary would have someone to take care of her for the rest of her life. And so, years after that, when he was writing his gospel, he remembered this seminal incident and memorialized it in his writing. So Mary is indeed the Blessed Mother, Blessed Mother of the Church and our Blessed Mother too. She loves all of us who love and honor her son. And she wants to help us live holy and fulfilling lives. She knows her son. She knows he will answer the prayers that she brings to him. And so when we entrust our deepest hopes and dreams and sorrows and wishes to Mary, maybe we can be a little bit more like her at Cana. Trust that she will bring our prayers to the Lord. Trust that he will answer the prayers in a way that may be surprising to us. And so can we be more trusting? Can we be more, can we be more ready for the surprises? And then can we express our gratitude for the blessings that we receive. And if we really want to go out on a limb, how about expressing the gratitude before we even have evidence that our prayers have been heard?